I know you're going to dig this. This is Ryan McGlynn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles, recorded live here at DATV Studios in Dayton, Ohio. And now, my studio guest is Mrs. Lucille Wilder, mother of Keith and Johnny Wilder of the Funk Group. Heat wave. Welcome, Mrs. Wilder. Oh, thank you. It is such a pleasure to have you on the show today. And I want to just let this be your show. We're going to just chit chat. And one of the things I want to start off with is how did you meet Johnny Wilder Sr.? Well, we were having a teenage dance in the soda baths, and Johnny was playing the music. He was a DJ. He was a DJ. Uh, for some reason or other, I went up on stage and sit next to him. For some reason or the other. Yeah, okay. but it, it wasn't what you think. <laughs> okay. And he said to me, because I'd been out there dancing, he said, you love to dance, don't you? And I said, oh, yeah, I do. And uh, he said, you know, I'd like to see you sometime. I wouldn't even know you, <laughs> <laughs> but it happened. So where did you go on your first date? He oh. came to the house, to my house, and my mother said, uh, young man, I didn't tell Lucille she could date yet. And he said, oh, Mrs. Pierce, I didn't come to see her. I came to see you. <laughs> oh, he, oh. oh, he had a way. Oh, yeah. Tell you. <laughs> yeah, those were the days. Uh, but so, we went together for a whole year, and then we got married. Okay, so yeah. you got, where did you get married? <laughs> Downtown in the UB building on the 13th floor oh. by a justice of the peace. All right. <laughs> so then you, where did you move then to? We roomed, because okay. we got married in 48, and we roomed one, two, three, four different places, and uh, I finally went back to my home place, which was the Soda Bass Court, that's where I was raised, and I asked Mr. Port <clears throat> for uh, an apartment. And he said, I'll see what I can do. And the next week he called me, and it was on. And I lived in a one-bedroom, two bedroom and grew to a three bedroom on Banker Place right behind the office. So he and his staff saw us all the time. And I say that to get to one thing. When the boys were here at uh, UD, Mr. and Mrs. Poor came. I was shocked. And I said, oh, I'm so surprised. He said, why? I've been watching my boys grow up. You know I wasn't going to miss this. And that made me feel good. So how many children did you have all together? Five boys. All yes. boys. All boys. So the only relationship you had with girls were daughter-in-laws. That's right. <laughs> and I've been blessed. I had five great daughter-in-laws. We all got along, I'll say. And I have two that's closer to my heart than the others, and that's Rosalind and Linda. I had to deal with Rosalind a lot 
In fact, I practically lived with her when Johnny got hurt. I was out there a lot, and we got to know each other. We never had an argument. She's a good girl, you know? I couldn't, I never had a daughter, but if I had one, she's it. Well, I know that makes her feel good. And Linda is the same way, both the girls. Well, we're going to go back to when you were in DeSoto Bass, you had your, did you have all the children? In, yeah. Uh, and, no, no. When you I lived didn't in have them all in the soda bath. Okay. I Who was the one. first one? Who was the first I, one in the soda bath? Ernest. Ernest was yeah, the first one. Yeah. So Ernest was the oldest. Uh huh. No, Johnny was the oldest. Uh, in the soda bath, you said. Okay. I had Johnny. We were rooming. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Johnny, then then that's why you needed to have another place because you had Johnny and then. And then I was pregnant with Ernest. Then you and would, I needed. So, more room. So you and Mr. Wilder were doing a lot of dancing. Uh, you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> you could say that. Yeah. So, so what is the age span between uh, all, well, all, well, where all your sons? Boys, um, uh, 15 months. Yeah, about 15 so months. So Johnny, Johnny Jr. was the oldest. Uh -huh. Then came Ernest. Ernest. Then came uh, Keith. Keith. Gregory. Gregory. And then Gerald. And then Gerald. Yes. Yeah, Gerald's the baby. Gerald's the baby, and Gerald became a minister. Yes. And he still is. Yes, he is. <laughs> so, so tell me how did, you know, the, the musical part of the family, what, what, how did they get interested into music? Well, after we moved into Soda Bass, we kids would come around all the time and we started a teenage club up uh, over the office there was a, a big room there and we had a teenage club and some of the boys from the club would come over to our house and sit on the front porch and sing and i i think that's i think it's really woo woo i don't know whether Anybody remembers Woo Woo, but I remember Woo Woo, Woo, -woo. <laughs> Woo Woo and his little his little friends. They'd come and sit on our porch, and I guess that's where they got the idea. Now Johnny could sing; I couldn't carry a tune. Now Johnny Senior could sing. Yes, yes, and, and I, I think a lot of people may not realize that Johnny Senior was the singer. Yes, in, in between the two of you. Yes, and where did he sing? Well, he sang when we'd go out for different dances, and he would be a, kind of a showman. He was a show-off, I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> but he would always sing. Did he croon to you? Uh, a little bit, not much. Oh, okay. It was for the crowd. Oh, it was yeah. for the crowd. <laughs> okay. So, so that's where the musical side comes yes. in. So, yeah. But all the boys can sing? No. Which oh, one? Wait. Oh, no. <laughs> Four of them could sing. Gregory is like his mama. He couldn't carry a tune. Okay. <laughs> and he didn't even try. <laughs> oh, I, you know, a person got to know their limitations. Yes. So, yes. so, um, so Johnny did, I know Johnny at one time was their manager. Wasn't Johnny Sr. the manager of, uh, of the group? Of, of, no. Oh, okay. Mm -mm. Uh, Johnny Jr. started the group when he was in Germany. When he was in the service? And when he was in the service. Okay. And so what high school did, did your sons go to? Chaminade. He went to Chaminade. Yeah. All of them except Gerald. Let me see. Please, Gregory. All but Gerald. Gerald told me, Mama. I don't want to go to Chaminade, and I said, good, because I'm tired of paying. <laughs> so where did Gerald go? <laughs> he went to Dunbar. Oh, yay, for uh, Dunbar. He, and he graduated from Dunbar. Yay, yeah. another Dunbar, <laughs> yes. Uh, Ernest graduated from Dunbar, too. He, he didn't like Chaminade that much. And at that time, $300 is what I had to pay a year for them to go to school. That's oh. back in uh, early 50s. Oh, my. 50s. That was a lot of money at that, that time. Well, not 50s, 60s, I'll say. That's still a lot of money. It was a lot of money. 
And I went to work at Chaminade to pay the tuition. How creative. <laughs> well, I was volunteering. Every time I turned around, my phone would ring. Miss Wilder, could you, come, could you uh, substitute with us today? And I said, yes, I can. And I was going almost every day. So I said, look here, how about me getting paid to do this? And I'll just come every day. And it worked out. It paid the tuition. And that, that, that's a wonderful uh, story paid, yeah. about, <laughs> about uh, how a parent get involved and, and how a job opportunities can come it about. Came out, yeah. Yeah, you yeah, know, it and was a, just to divert a little bit, we, um, you know, we try to tell young people all the time, volunteering is something that they can put on their resume, mm -hmm. and you never know, it can lead to a, a job. Mm -hmm. and, and here's a prime example, back in the 60s, you did it, and it helped with the tuition for your sons mm -hmm. to go to Chaminade at that time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, all uh, after uh, Johnny graduated from Shamnod, mm -hmm. then what happened? What did he do next? He joined the service. He, jo he what? worked, but then he decided to go into the service. Now, which branch? Army. Army, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. And er, let me see, Johnny and Ernest were in the Army. Uh, Keith Gregory and Gerald were in the Navy. Are they like water? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, wouldn't have been my choice. <laughs> but I, you know, I mean, I've heard, you know, I've heard that you've done a, you you teach a little water aerobics, so uh, <laughs> so therefore, you know, the water is in in the DNA. Yeah, okay. Okay. So the three of them, your yeah. DNA had to be there. We had yeah. three of them went to the Navy, yeah. and two of them <laughs> went to the Army. <laughs> so while while Johnny was in the Army, what um, what happened over there? Uh, well, you know, actually his wife could tell you more, but they had Carla over there, and they had a German babysitter, because Johnny was like his dad, he liked to go out and dance and party. And they had Carla over there. And from what they told me, you know, he's still carrying on with his music. And he got some of the guys over there, and that's when he organized his band. So he had a German, uh, Bilbo's, I think Bilbo was German. He had, uh, I can't think of everybody's name, but uh, they were all from another country to begin with. So what was that band called? Heatwave. Well, I think it started out as Chicago Heatwave. He dropped the Chicago, and I'm glad, because we don't know nothing about Chicago. <laughs> But then he dropped the Chicago and became Heat Wave. So that's where it originally started from him being in the military over in Germany, and then he had a culturally diverse band at that yes. time. Yes. So the band played probably around in Europe during that time? They did, uh huh. And developed a reputation. Yeah, and then they came over here and played at UD. But the reputation their reputation beat them over here. They were doing well before they got here. So, so Europe was good to them, and unfortunately, so many musicians, especially African-American musicians, uh, were more appreciated uh, overseas than yeah. they were here, and so, and so once they established uh, their reputation overseas and they got welcomed here, so that was the same scenario mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we Face with heat wave, and and so what's the history behind uh, boogie nights? I have no idea. Okay, well <laughs> that's a very candid answer. <laughs> so I have no idea about any of it. Now I've always felt that when Johnny sang "Always and Forever," he was singing to his wife Rosalind. He dearly loved Rosalind. Always and, and forever. forever. And, uh -huh. and you know, and he, he and and each time you heard him sing that, that you I'm could thinking you could singing. feel you could feel the emotion yes. of that song. Yes. And yes. it's still a classic I know today. Yeah. And it's wonderful. It is yeah. wonderful. So are any of 
Uh, so I, I want to try to get to the, the whole heat wave um, era, mm -hmm. and because Greg was with, was Greg? No. No, Greg's not the singer. No. It, it's uh, it's it Johnny and... Um, well, uh, so I don't know, when Johnny asked Keith to come over, because Keith liked to sing too, uh, Johnny had Keith come over and then Keith joined him. I don't know what year or anything like that, but he brought his brother over and they did it. They cooked together. Now, did you go over? <laughs> no. You never went over? No, not to Germany. I did go to England because Keith married a girl from London. When they played over there, he fell in love with a girl from London, not London, Liverpool. So uh, that's my other daughter-in-law, and she's sweet as all get out. She. Uh, so how was that experience when you went to England? England. Oh, it was wonderful. Where did they play? Uh, I don't know. All right. I'm old. No, uh, I don't no. remember those things. Yes, ma'am. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, uh, while you were in England. So how were they received when they were in England? I never heard them sing in England. I, um, when I went over, Keith, we went over to stay with Keith and his wife and child. And it was just a, a holiday for us, you know, my husband and I, to be with the family. Oh, you went for and a visit, they, not yeah, not to see them yeah. perform. Okay. No, 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 no. I was thinking that you went. I didn't went, see them perform till they came here. I was thinking that you went there, and mm. although you were visiting nah. the family, you were there for. Oh, we just said no. Nah. Nah. Okay. Mm. <laughs> well, yeah. Although I did get to travel with them a few times. So tell me about that experience. It was nice to see all the people, you know, go off and. <laughs> and applaud and sing along and all of that. Feel that energy? Yeah. Uh -huh. Scared me because Johnny and Keith would jump, go up to the highest point in, on the stage and jump off. They'd roll off and scare me to death. I, I'm sure. <laughs> and, and you know, but, I, just think about that. That was way ahead of their time because, you know, Prince did some of that mm -hmm. later were trailblazers in some of the things that they did mm -hmm. and that other artists picked up later mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's, uh, what was your favorite song? What's your favorite song that they recorded? Always and Forever. Always and mm -hmm. Forever. You mm -hmm. know, I heard them, I heard mm -hmm. them, your son sing that to you at your 80th birthday mm -hmm. party, mm -hmm. which is about six years ago. Well, I wasn't going to say that. I don't mind. Well, <laughs> Yes, ma'am. It took me a long time to get to be 86, so I don't mind at all. Well, you're glamorous. You're, you're, you're glamorous. And, uh, you know, and it goes back to what Pearl Bailey said. So she said, she said uh, African Americans have so many problems, but, but God didn't give us the looks to go with them. And you are a prime no, example no. of that. <laughs> and and you, you are a blessed looking. I would have thought you were no more. If I didn't know better, I would think you would know better. And, in your early 70s somewhere. Oh, thank you. I don't have any money, but thank you. But, you know, <laughs> thank you is good enough. And so so I, I want to talk about um, the, the history of the band. Now, what role did you and your husband play as they uh, mastered their Nothing. craft? They did it all on their own. You were supportive, weren't you? Yeah, that's all. Johnny Jr. was like his father. Okay, uh, and how and was that? <laughs> he could do it all. He didn't need any help. So he was that positive about himself. He know he knew what he could do, and he did it. And you couldn't talk him out of it. In fact, <laughs> I'll tell you something funny. They used to call my husband Hitler, and they called Johnny Jr. Hitler Jr. They were, oh, it's their way or no way. And that sounds terrible, but that's how they were. So but I, they were good. They were good at it. Well, you, you know, but, but to have a band, to, to control a band, yes. you, you, you got to have some. Uh, and the band members jumped when he said, 
they said hi hi and, and you know <laughs> practice you have to have discipline mm -hmm. and you have to have somebody in <laughs> charge to make sure that it works yeah. and and he so, was the one and he was the one <laughs> <laughs> definitely and, and so how long did the the band play together oh they're still playing together well but, but they've changed band members bilbo is still living Mario died, uh, I'm trying to think. I've talked to Bilbo, he's, he's not well, but he, he's still alive, I, I can say. But I can't remember all of their names right off, but they were all nice young men. They came, uh, when Johnny got hurt, the whole band came to the house. And I was living on Denison at the time and I had a sort of a gold-like couch, kind of inexpensive. And Bilbo sat on my couch and broke a leg. He's, broke a couch leg. That oh, is. oh he, I was going to say. He was a big fella. Oh, I, 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 okay. I'm glad you cleared that up because it sounded like when he no, sat on the couch, he, yeah, broke he, broke a he broke his and leg. And I'm going like, what a, kind of couch is that? We ended up with a Coca-Cola uh, uh, container to hold the couch up on that end. <laughs> so he, he, he had some, um, he, he was a little expansive. He was a little big. Who? Bill Wolf. Yeah. 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 He was kind of heavy. He was the heaviest one in the group. Now, what instrument did he play? Oh, no, you didn't ask me that. <laughs> drums. Uh -huh. Yeah, he played drums. He played. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. See, I don't yeah well, well, he played drums, and, uh -huh. and then, you know, you had um, uh, Roy Carter, who, yes. re who replaced uh, Winton. Yeah, when. Um, Winton? Yeah, Winton, W H I T T E N, Jesse Winton. Remember? Oh, Jesse. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, Roy Carter replaced him, yeah. and when they did the album uh, "Too Hot to, to Handle. Handle," yes, yeah. that was. Oh boy, you. Oh well, you've got it written down. So. <laughs> well, I mean, just tell everybody that I'm that I'm over here with a crib. I'm sorry. No, that's all right, Miss Wilder. Just I'm tell sorry. everybody I'm over here with a crib sheet. Okay. Uh, and, and that was in 1976. You know, uh, that, that's why we love you, Miss Wilder. Okay. I'm uh, sorry. No, 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 no. Your candidness <laughs> is is probably welcoming. Um, and, and then their third single was Boogie Nights, and that was their premier album in 1977. So you still have these albums? Uh, I have one album. Which one? The first one. The first one? Yeah. Too Hot to Handle? No. No, okay. I, oh, is it? I don't remember. Huh? And Too Hot to Handle was the first. Was uh, okay. Okay, and then their third single was Boogie Nights, which we've already declared that you don't know what was behind Boogie yeah, Nights. No. Okay, and so, but we do, we did declare that uh, Always and Forever was dedicated to his wife. Uh, okay. I felt. Well, I, that, that's all that counts. Yeah. And then in 1977, um, on, on the British popular music charts in January and in, and in America in November, Boogie Nights was selling. So, I mean, so Boogie Nights is one of those, that, uh, when you saw the video, well, I mean, they really worked hard on that. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look, when you go back and you look at the LPs and you look what they wore, you know, <laughs> I'm like, okay, but everything is, you know, everything is cyclic. It's coming back. Everybody's wearing that again. So... Well. You know, I lived on Denison, and there was an apartment building across the street, and this one young man put Boogie the Nights on, and he played it all day, every day. <laughs> and it was summertime. So you could hear it? I heard it every day, more than I heard always and forever. <laughs> but well, he loved it. Well, you know, Boogie Nights was certified platinum, and then the group's other, you know, the album that they released, they released it, re-released the Too Hot to Handle in 1977, giving Heat Wave number, a number 11 on a Hot 200 and number 5 on the R&B charts, while the next single, mm. The Soul Ballad, Always and Forever, reached number 18 on the Hot 100 
in April 1978. So what was happening, what were you doing in April of 1978 when they, when this reached uh, uh, number 18? Uh, I think I was working down at Reich's. Reich's, that's the name of the past, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. And it also reached number two on the R&B charts. So that, that single was also certified platinum. So the, the platinum records, where are they now? Okay, uh, Rosalind has Johnny's. And I had Keith until Keith moved back to uh, the States. And when they uh, bought a house and they got established, I gave him all his, his uh, platinum and gold, all that. I gave them all to him. And Linda has them hanging on her wall now. Okay. But I just, they were on my wall in the basement. We entertained a lot. Yes, you did. <laughs> uh, yes, you did. I, I, I can recall uh, Denison Street being loaded with cars coming to the Wilder's house for a party. And they'd say, oh, we had to park down on Germantown because uh, we couldn't get on you your You couldn't street. find a place to park. Yeah, we had fun. You you we did. Loved. You had a we lot. Had a, uh, you and your husband were great entertainers. <laughs> so we know that your children got it honestly about entertaining and welcoming Welcome people, people into the your your mm -hmm. home. Ernest so. sang uh, the a solo when he graduated from uh, Dunbar High School. He sang the solo for their graduation. And you remember what the name of it was? No. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> you know. Well, I just, there you go. Oh, well, no, no, there you go. You brought it up. So I figured if no, you... No, I don't remember. So I, I figured if you brought it up, then you were going to finish no. it up. Oh, no. Okay. So now now I'm moving on to... Then they continued to use Barry Blue's production skills. Who was Barry Blue? I don't know. Okay. Well, Barry Blue was the producer. And then <laughs> Heat Wave released their second album, Central... Heating mm, yes. in April of 1978. And then the lead single was The Groove Line, and it reached number seven on the Hot 100 in July 1978. And this single was also certified as platinum. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, yeah, w w w how did you, um, when they were on tour, how did how how often did you communicate with your sons when they were on the road? I think uh, I went with them <coughs> all of three times. Once, well, here in Dayton, and then I went a couple of more times. I don't remember the state, but I traveled with them. In fact, when Johnny died, I was with Keith and. We were somewhere, I don't remember. Uh, he, Keith was performing. I didn't go to that performance for some reason or other. I stayed in the hotel. And then that's when my daughter-in-law called me and told me. No, my son Gerald called me and told me. So how many grandchildren do you have? I have 15 grandchildren. And are any of them singers? Uh, yeah, Keith's family, the girls, all two of the girls and one boy sing and dance. Uh, and dance. And dance. Also, and fact, uh, Keith Jr. Uh, teaches dance. Really? Uh huh. Where? Uh, in Georgia. Oh, so they live in Georgia. They live in Georgia. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Keith Jr. teaches dancing and he also sings. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you have you have children, that, grandchildren that have the DNA of both uh, their grandparents singing as well as dancing, dancing. on okay, your you. your part. Right, <laughs> I get right. a little bit of that. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> so the, during the late 1970s, the band changed, and at first Eric. Johns quit the band and Billy Jones was his replacement as guitarist. So what instruments did each of your sons play? No, none. none. Johnny or uh, Keith didn't play an instrument. To my knowledge, oh. you look puzzled, but oh, to no. my knowledge they didn't. 
Okay. And, and then as then Rod Temperton quit the band, and although Temperman would continue writing new songs for Heat Wave, yeah. he soon became better known for his songwriting oh, yes. for other artists, yes. pinning award-winning songs for some of the funk's biggest names, including Rufus, My Michael Jackson, the Brothers Johnson, George Benson, Herbie Hancock, Quincy Jones, and then he did a famous partnership that remains one forge with Michael Jackson, Jackson yeah. writing three songs uh -huh. for um, <clears throat> for uh, his 1979. He was like family, even though he quit the band. He, he never left. He, he never left. Yeah. He never left. Uh, no. Now, where is he from? He was from England, London. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, in uh, when they t tell me about when he played, when they, well, let's go back to when they played, came home, played at Dayton, at the UD in 1978. Tell me about that. How, 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 the, how was that? You know, I mean, that that's something to think about because sometimes when artists come back home, they don't get received as well as you would want oh, them to they be. Were well received. So, tell me in about fact, that experience. In fact, uh, we had a party afterwards. A party. And uh, <clears throat> Shaka Khan called me, and she said, I would really like to come up there, but I've been drinking a little. And I said, that's okay, I have too. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> but she told me, she said, I really like Johnny, but uh, he's married. So Keith wasn't married at that time, so it was like, I'll settle for Keith, you know. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> well, Shaka Khan was very candid with her conversation yes. to to Johnny's yes. mother, Johnny and Keith's yeah. mother, uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. But I'd, I'd never met her in person. But she you just talked to her on the phone. Well, I, I tell you, um, that, how, who all famous did you meet with while they were on the road? You, if you can remember. I met Roger. Roger Trotman? Trotman. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Roger used to come through the store because he was seeing a girl that I worked with. And she was a girl. I was a woman. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. I, I, right. I got the distinction okay. here. He used to come through and pick her up, and they'd go to lunch together. And then I also on one of the outings with the group when the Roger and Heatway were on the same venue, uh, I saw him. I got to see a lot of celebrities at that time, a lot of singers. Okay. So, oh, so Roger and uh, Heat Waves shared a stage together? I mean, a venue? And yeah, I, but I don't remember what it was or when. <laughs> that, that's but okay. I, I, <laughs> I know uh, I was on the same plane. I didn't know Roger. I was on the same plane as he was going to that particular venue. So one of the things, I, uh, uh, what are some of your fondest memories uh, of the band as the matriarch of the family? What, what are some of your fondest memories? It's when Johnny got hurt and the whole gang came to Dayton and came to the house and they were like my children. That's, that was my greatest, and they were all respectful, very nice young men. And they just felt like an extension of my family because they were my boys' ages. All of them were about the same age. And so they were just a good group. You know, so many people know you as the matriarch of the Wilder family. And so when you out and about doing your daily activities and people show you a lot of respect. How does that make you feel? Uh, you know, <clears throat> if it's fame, it doesn't bother me. So I was a lucky mom that time and my kids did something outstanding. But I don't go around shouting from the rooftop that I'm Heatwave's mother. When I say Wilder, oh, are you related to Johnny Wilder? <laughs> I, I think so. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 
I just feel normal. Well, you know, I, you, you're a proud mother. Yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, last, I, I just want to talk about how did you, what did you think about, what do you think about having a funk museum and, and how they had the grand opening and you were there and they honored the Wilder uh, family. I felt because, good. Yes. I felt really good. Uh, they had entertainment while we were there and during the break and it was wonderful. But then they went to give the history of Johnny and they said he went to Dunbar. And I thought, oh, he didn't. I paid too much money for them to say that. <laughs> So I went down on the stage. And corrected <laughs> and them. And corrected them, yes. Well, well I can understand now, that since yeah. you had to go to work there. I had uh, to work to pay for it, pay being for there. Him and Keith both. Uh, the defunct all-star band was also there at the, the Funk Museum's yep. uh, opening. And, and you, know, you know, one of the things that I, I think to for Dayton, Ohio, to have local legends around, and you know, to have a have a glamorous matriarch like yourself, uh, who who still gets out there and do a little line dancing, and yeah, um, and uh, not as much, but, but I, me, me still doing it. I try to do and, one but, or two when I go out. But I finally want to ask you, uh, why do you think the the Funk Museum? Uh, Hall of Fame is important to be here in Dayton, Ohio? Well, it shows people that you can come from meager beginning to be someone recognized. Uh, the boys didn't have a record of, uh, with the police. They were uh, good boys of my in fact people would say if i kept other people's children too because oh you you got those boys in line you know and i kept other people's children but they grew up knowing how to perform uh with other people how to act around other people they were mannerable and they surprised me because as I know I taught them all that, but to go out and do it when I'm not around is amazing to me. Because I thought, oh, it finally worked, you know? <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> I think if you want to look up to them, they tried, they bettered themselves. They got somewhere. They got married had families, bought homes, they did well. While they were in the business and the families are doing well now that they're gone. So the Funk Hall, <coughs> the Funk Music Hall of Fame is really a tribute to folks who come from Dayton, do well, and Heat Wave and, is an example of how the members and, of that's something to be proud of. Yes. Yeah, we do have something to be proud of. I didn't get to see the display that they have going now, but when on Philadelphia Drive at the library, I did go up there to see it. And there were some Japanese coming through on a tour. And they were walking around, and I was at Johnny's, and cubicle where his stuff was. And <clears throat> when they got there, I said, those are my sons. And they got the cameras out and went to snapping <laughs> pictures. I thought, oh my goodness, I didn't mean to cause that. But that, now that made me feel good. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And just to think that they were going to take it back to their country and brag on us. And that you know what that uh, the, the 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 funk music hall of fame and exhibition center is so needed because so many of our artists and I know that 
uh, Unsung did mm -hmm. a series of uh, on mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. heat wave, yeah. but I think it's important that we're <coughs> able to do one too with you here, and and it's so important to keep that history going because music is the eye to the soul, and funk music develop an era that will never go away, mm -hmm. no matter how they try to change it. And I think the importance of the Funk Music Hall of Fame is to continue the meaning of what funk music was. And, you know, and I have to always say to uh, my listening audience is that, you know, David Webb, who, who lives and breathes the funk Music you, Hall of Fame I'm and exi <laughs> Exhibition Center, even mm -hmm. if I think he got cut, it would, the blood would say, Funk Music <laughs> Museum uh -huh. Hall of Fame. Oh, and okay. so, I, and, 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 but that's what you need. So we go back to how Johnny Sr. and how Johnny Jr., you need those type of people to make things happen, happen. Yeah, and keep the rest true. of us mm -hmm. on track. Yeah. And I just want to thank you so much, Ms. Wilder, <laughs> for being our guest today. This is Ryan McLinn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles. Until the next time, keep it funky. <laughs> <laughs> Always and forever Each moment with you Is just like a dream to <laughs>